Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today I've got my friend Jason Bond of Bond Outfitters on the line. Jason, how you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. How about you? I'm doing well. I'm up here in Colorado and um, getting to do a little bit of fishing and hiking and getting the summer started off. Um, you know, I know it's kind of a crazy time with all the shelter in place, but it, it looks like most of the states are kind of slowly but surely starting to open up and looks like Arizona uh, is as well. That's right. Yeah. Um, the woods are sure packed right now in the lakes. That's for sure. Everybody's getting out in the outdoors and enjoying it. Yeah, you know, um, some of these states, it's crazy. They're not letting them even get out and fish, um, you know, and hunt. And some of the states have shut down, you know, turkey hunting. It's been kind of a crazy spring. But uh, I want to talk to you today because we've got a deadline coming up of June 9th for the Arizona deer and desert bighorn sheep uh, in Arizona. And I wanted to talk to you about the deer units. Um, You're a very successful deer guide, and I've had you on the podcast a bunch uh, talking about the different units. Um, so I want to do that today. Before we get into that, uh, I just wanted to catch up and say uh, or see what uh, what you have been doing in this last couple of months. Um, you know, I, I assume your kids are out of school and, you know, what's going on with all of that? Yeah, they've been out of school since March, basically spring break. We were down at Bartlett Lake Camp for oh seven or eight days, and that's kind of when the, uh, the state went on shutdown for Arizona. So that was, uh, you know, the, the last day before spring break was the last time they were in school. Um, but it's, it's it, you know, it's been a grind. This online schooling stuff, my kid, you know, it's like pulling teeth to get them to do work. A lot of battles at home and uh, glad it was <laughs> over today is the last day of it. So, uh, yeah, they're finished up and schoolwork scanned in and sent in and, and report cards are, are pretty much out. Um, I, I would have been for sure the kid if, you know, if I was in school during this that, you mean I got to be home and I got to look out the window and you want me to actually do homework and all this nonsense <laughs> when I could be out there playing in the yard or doing something? It's, I mean, you have a greater appreciation for teachers, I'm sure. Oh, huge, huge appreciation for teachers. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's been tough, you know, and a lot of stuff you haven't seen in, in 30 years either looking at ancient <laughs> European history. Uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of Googling going on. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. Um, but the fishing's been good. We've been going out fishing, and uh, we did some hiking around and, and just enjoying the outdoors really during the shutdown. Now that Arizona's opening back up, we're starting to get out a little bit. Right on. What are you gearing up for now as you're moving forward, looking forward to the 2020 season? I am just going through trail cameras and stuff like that. And uh, Next week I'll be headed up to 13B and 13A to spend uh, seven or eight days up there setting cameras uh, for the year. And you know, right now we're hitting that dry time when you need to get those cameras out before the monsoons hit. And hopefully they'll hit about normal, about July 4th or so. And at least we get an eyeball on some of the bucks when they get started before the rains hit and kind of disperse off the waters, you know, to have an idea of what, what's going on for the guys that draw right there at the end of June, 1st of July. They'll find out, you know, kind of what, what everybody's looking at. So we, we'll have an idea of what's out there. Obviously not finished out growth wise, but, you know, a good idea of what's starting out. What kind of trail cameras are you using? Mostly stealth cam. I, ha- I have a few Brownings, uh, but uh, probably 30 or 40 Brownings, and the rest are all stealth, stealth cams. And I had real good luck with the stealth cams, that's for sure. What, what um, card size are you usually putting out there when you're doing a long set like this? You know, whatever I can find on sale, you know, I'm, I find, I, last year I found a bunch of 32 gigs, so that's kind of what I went with last year. I mean, more... The more, the better. These cameras, the battery life is so good on them, you know, minus, you know, some of the cattle ponds and stuff like that, that you can't control the cows unless you're setting your timer on your cameras to be off during the day when the cows are just going to stand in front of your camera. But usually you can get, you know, for sure the month out of them. Now on the strip, you got a lot of birds that'll land on those waters and they'll just be there all day. So you might have thousands of pictures of just birds. Um, so you got, you got to have that, you know, the higher the gig, the better. Any tips for guys setting cams as far as um, angles? Um, what works best for you? Yeah, you know, I try not to set anything east-west. Um, I, I, you know, you don't want to catch that morning sun and afternoon sun. You'll just blur out your picture. So I try to set everything 
kind of north south or at least at an angle where I'm not catching the glare from the morning sun, which seems to be real bad. And that's that's one of the biggest things. And then obviously you gotta you gotta check for movement in front of your cameras. Uh, last year we had so much growth, you know, pop up uh, in June, undergrowth, and and the weeds had just you know went from basically nothing where they died off and fell off in the winter and and a lot of cameras that i saw set out and and mine included you know were underneath the weeds by the time i went back and checked them the first time so you end up with a bunch of nothing because those weeds will pop up and if your camera's not high enough then they're going to be underneath the weeds uh but that and 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 stuff moving in front of your cameras i mean those are the biggest things and then obviously making sure you turn them on and didn't just lock it. <laughs> That's happened. You're so oh, yeah. anticipating the, the good set you've had for a month and a half, and you get up there and realize the battery's full and the card is empty and the, the, the on button is on off. Exactly. It's like a There's kick in the nuts, man. Nothing worse than that. For sure. Um, let's talk about uh, conditions. Um, you know, We're going to talk about 13A, 13B strip uh conditions obviously you probably are heading up there next week but what are you anticipating yeah it's been real good one of my guys has been up there for a few weeks uh trying to kill a lion and looking for antlers uh i guess about the last month so he'll be there through the end of this month when lion season closes um he's been calling me every so often and and you know the the growth is looking good the feed's looking good um we're right on track with what last year was for moisture since january 1st um you know pretty close to about the exact same moisture level that we've had on the strip so i'm expecting another good year that doesn't include that three foot snow we got you know right there at uh all the late rifle bull hunt and the uh last three days of the kaibab hunt last year so that kicked off our winter good um you know we did have a super dry monsoon last year and a very dry fall all the way through the rifle deer hunts on the 13a 13b hunt um 13a got snow right there at the end with the kaibab but um yeah the the, the moisture is looking phenomenal i think i think it's looking you know similar to last year if 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 right right there with it so if we get a few more timely rains um which we're obviously at our dry time right now but i you know i think they've got what they need to carry through i wouldn't be scared for anybody with any kind of point level to be putting in this year you know, it's always nice to have that point guard just in case something happens family-wise or, or physically with, with a person that draws. Sure. I'm looking here. Um, I'm actually on GoHunt.com. I'm looking at 12A East, 12A West, 12B, talking about the archery hunt, August 21st to, the, to September 10th. And it looks like as a resident, it's a six six point is 100% guarantee. Uh, for that hunt i'm curious do you do that is that one of the hunts that you do you know i i've done it i try not to do it too much i don't i i don't think a whole lot about it i think there's great bucks up there which there obviously is um i personally talk to you know lots of guys every year and i i try to talk them into doing over the counter archery hunts over that hunt and if if they want a quality archery hunt then they're they're probably better off waiting for a 13 a 13 b tag um a lot of guys have the the, i guess the idea that they're going to go up on 12 a west 12 b west whatever and and kill a you know 200 inch deer with a bow just because it's a kaibab and it's a tough hunt now there are going to be some 200 inch bucks killed on that hunt but you know if you see a 170 buck that's that's probably what you ought to be hunting and in my opinion you can hunt some over the counter tags without drawing a tag and using bonus points um and hunt that caliber of buck over the counter every year that being said it's a phenomenal hunt it's a lot of fun there's a lot of deer you're going to see a lot of bucks uh, a lot of shot opportunities um you know nowhere in the state of arizona are you going to have as fun of a hunt as that but just don't go up there expecting to hunt you know 190 inch plus deer every year all right um let's jump to uh t- unit 12a east muzzleloader hunt it's november 6th through november 12th and it looks like a uh, non-resident with 19 points would be a guarantee to draw that tag if you have 18 it's a 50 percent chance do you do that hunt i do um i think that's a good hunt it's it's just after the uh, early rifle hunt so i think i think you have some good opportunities the tag numbers are way down so the quality of the hunt is there um what is there 15 tags this year on that hunt 
Yeah, I don't. Um, yeah, fifteen. I, I think it's I think it's fifteen tags on that hunt this year. I think it's a fun hunt, and and if a guy hunts hard, you're going to catch them on the top all the way up in their summer ground, and possibly, you know, midway down on the east side, and possibly with a little bit of snow or a lot of snow, you might have them all the way in the bottom. Um, probably a little early for the rut, but you know, you're getting there after that first rifle hunt in there so you'll have some deer obviously had a little bit of pressure the previous you know 10 10 days before that hunt there was a the rifle hunt going on so it's a good hunt um i i prefer i i think the 12b west tag on that muzzleloader hunt is probably going to be a little better than that 12a east um just because those deer on the early rifle hunt on 12b west are about halfway down um and later in the hunt a lot more deer get down so you'll have you'll have a lot better glassing opportunity on that 12b west hunt i'm looking at the but, 12b muzzleloader right now and it looks like it, as most things the point creep continues and um with 19 points you know, as a non-resident only a 1.5 percent chance to draw um th- that that's yep. that's a high demand hunt for sure isn't it it really is and and uh, you know the qualities there, um, and like I said, it's usually the, the early hunt. You usually get those last few days, um, and those deer really start piling off the top, whether there's snow or no snow. Um, so it's it, it can sure turn out to be a really good hunting area. And again, you just don't have any hunting pressure, you know, compared to the early rifle hunts. So I, I guess if you're in that middle ground, um, looking at a 13b or 13a tag i mean obviously you can draw that a lot this muzzleloader tag a lot easier than that than the strip um and a little bit easier than that that late 12a tag which i think was at 21 points last year or something for 12a and 12b west for that that late hunt yeah what about since we're talking about 12b you've got the uh 12b early which is october 23rd through november 1st and it looks like for non-resident, it's a 20 point, but then you also have the 12B uh, late hunt, uh, October 20th through November 29th. You, you've killed some phenomenal bucks on that late hunt, right? Yeah, and, and the early hunt. The biggest buck we've ever killed up there in 12B West was on the early hunt, actually, um, 254. Uh, that was on the 12B West early hunt. Um, but on, yeah, the early, some on the early hunt yeah the early hunt wow um but we've killed some giants on the late hunt too now you know that that was 2017 we killed that buck and it was one of those years that you know we didn't have any snow but the temperatures got real cold on top which i think froze the food those deer came off the top we just had a phenomenal hunt in the winter range that year um both in 12a west and 12b west deer pushed all the way down with no snow and that was on the early hunt so um it was just a slammer year and i tell guys you know you know you're going to have a great hunt on the early hunt 25 percent of the time you're going to have a good hunt about 60 percent of the time and it's going to be tough on that 12b west early hunt the the remainder of the time i mean just you just don't know it until the hunt starts yeah so for those people that are kind of looking there's 12b and then there's 12b west and in the 12b hunt you can hunt both correct but in the west you can only stay in the west portion of 12b exactly the 12b hunt gives you the Priya plateau uh the sands up on top which has a you know a resident herd of deer up there um not so much in 12b west 12b west is more of a migratory unit where there's very 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 few deer that live there year round 12b does have a, a resident group of deer that live there and there's some absolute giants in there um, but you got to be, pre- be prepared to hunt that, that Priya plateau, which is very minimal deer. Um, and a lot of guys will get frustrated. They'll draw that 12 B tag and they'll just bail out of there and go hunt 12 B West just because they're going to see, you know, a hundred deer a day. Let's talk about, um, the Kaibab. Let's talk about the East side and the West side. Uh, we'll start with the East side, uh, talking about the early hunt and the late hunt, um, uh, looking at the go hunt odds. It looks like for non-residents. It's uh, 16 points for the early hunt, which is crazy in my mind. But uh, and then it takes max points or or 22, excuse me, Drew, the east side late hunt. Uh, talk about the east side a little bit. Yeah, I mean that's uh, 
it, it blows me away too with the amount of points to draw that early tag you know based on what you said there i mean it's that that's a tough one to put in for with that many points i mean you're almost better off waiting for late tag at that point but with point creep you just don't know where it's going to end up with the amount of non-residents with with 16 or more bonus points right um you know there's there's well over i don't know 1500 people with more than 16 bonus points something like that maybe 1200 um but the 12 day east early hunt you know you're going to be hunting up on top and there's a burn up on top the worm fire that went through i don't know six years seven years ago uh, a lot of deer in it it's going to get a lot of pressure you know opening day obviously and and some of the deer will push into the trees not come out into there until dark but you only have 95 tags in there this year compared to 450 on the west side so you you don't have as much ground to hunt as you do on the west side, but you also have, you know, a quarter of the tags that you do on the west side. Can be a good hunt, um, can also be tough. Uh, if the deer push off, it's not as far to the winter range as it is on the west side. Uh, five five miles they can be in the winter range, you know, dropping off to the east side game road. Uh, and that puts you at the pinion juniper country and then, you know, drop off another three miles and, and you're down in the sage flats. So it's it's a fairly short trip for them from aspen trees to sage isn't one of the problems with that hunt is that transition country in that unit is it's pretty tough to hunt no it's a jungle yeah it's it's super super thick um and and most of most of deer you know compared to 15 20 years ago when you had quite a few more deer going off that east side um most of deer going off the west side and then you know 12a west and 12b west uh right now and not near as many deer dropping off into the 12a east what do you think about the east side the late hunt the dates are the 20th through the 29th so they're not necessarily going quite as deep you know in years past it's gone into december but surely that's you know right in in the rut there what do you think of that hunt you know we've done well on it um last year we had a guy in there uh we hunted the full 10 days in there looking for you know a giant buck uh we saw four big bucks um you know i'd say in that 190 plus range um it's it's not the hunt it used to be there are still some slammers in there no doubt about it you know two years ago we hunted it and killed two bucks over 200 um last year you know just was a little bit tougher for us so um it consistently produces big deer. There's always going to be big deer in there. Like you said, it, you know, that middle range is so thick. The top is so thick minus the burn. Um, and the burn's coming back. I mean, the aspen trees are 12 feet tall in the burn now. So it's it's thick up on in, in the burn even. Um, but the deer have the ability to get old. The deer that do reside on the east side for the most part, um, there's some chances of some absolute giant deer making it through because of the cover they have uh, over there. And, 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 you know, Saddle Mountain Wilderness, a lot of guys won't, won't backpack into that quite, quite so much, but there's a lot of roadless areas, um, in the transition area, um, big canyons, uh, and a lot of sage flats and the deer can go way out in the sage. So it's always got the possibility to produce something, something special. Let's talk about the West side. So the, the 12 a West, um, early hunt, if you want to start with that, it's, it's a great hunt. Again, you've got the warm fire on top that kind of split the highway where, where you got East and West side. Um, that'll get a lot of pressure for 50 tags, uh, kind of sounds like a shooting range in their opening day. Um, a lot of good bucks in there. They'll, they'll be in the, in the burn and then obviously work their way to the tree lines, that type of stuff. Uh, the rest of the kind of plateau on the West side holds, just as many deer um you just can't see them because of the trees but you know they've been doing some projects up there of thinning thinning the pine trees and they're also thinning a bunch of juniper country uh that have opened up a lot of different habitat for the deer that they seem to be getting into quite a bit um you have a major transition zone at, at where, when they start migrating off the top and it's kind of a mix of of uh oaks and pine trees uh, they'll hold up in there for quite a while. That's good hunting. Um, and then you've got a huge winter ground that goes all the way to Kanab Creek, uh, basically from from Silwatch Point all the way up to Snake Gulch. 
do you believe that that 12A West late hunt has been getting better and better and better? I think it's getting better. I think, you know, the tag reduction they did last year, it was the year before, um, with the junior tags, the early tags, the late tags, uh, just all the tags in general, the archery tags. I think it's going to help the Kaibab out quite a bit. You know, age class has always been the issue with the Kaibab. Um, you just, we, you, you've got to find older age class deer to find, to find what, what, you know, we're looking for anyway. Um, you know, you can still have a three and a half year old, 200 inch deer. Um, but you really like to see those deer start hitting six years old, you know, seven years old. And I think with the tag reduction, I think it's going to help it quite a bit. Um, I think last year was a little bit tough just because of that storm that rolled in. It was kind of like the elk hunt where if guys didn't kill by the time that storm hit, it was, it was tough. Um, you know, cause you couldn't get around. Tough. Yeah. Access was tough. Foot access, vehicle access, everything was tough. Deer were buried in the trees after the snow hit, you know, cause less snow in the trees, uh, the open stuff where they're usually at in some of that, that burn country. Um, they just weren't out there because how deep the snow was. So yeah, it, I think a lot of deer got saved last year. Um, there are some good bucks killed. I don't think anything crazy exceptional that I saw got killed last year on, on any of the hunts on the kite out. Um, which is a good thing because they're there. Uh, they just didn't get killed. So, so I think it, I think it is getting better. I'm looking at the go hunt insider here for non-residents, the West side early hunt for non-residents, 13 points. Uh, the, the West side late hunt is 22 points. For residents on the on the west side, early hunt is nine, and for residents, sixteen uh, for that late hunt. Uh, would it surprise you? Well, let me ask you this: if if you had clients on the twelve a west late hunt, uh, would you be if if you had a client that you know could get around and could shoot and fairly reasonable expectations? I mean, do you think a two hundred inch plus buck is achievable? Oh yeah. Yeah. We, we target 200 inch type deer. I mean, that's, that's given, you know, obviously a typical versus a non-typical. I mean, if you see a buck in the one nineties as a clean typical, that's a giant deer. Um, something that's a six by six or seven by six, it's breaking 200. Yeah. I think it's super achievable. You know, that's generally what we shoot for is a 200 inch mark. And that's, that's given, you know, one nineties on a typical and breaking 200 on something with some extras. You would definitely so th- go with the 12A West late over the 12A East late, right? I would. I do 12A West late and 12B West late is is my two choices of, of what I would do up there. Like I said, it takes a special guy to hunt the 12B. I think you've got a better opportunity. The draw, draw odds aren't that much different for 12A West and 12B West than, than 12A East. You're going to see a lot more deer, have a lot more opportunity to see a, a quality deer just by the numbers of deer in both units talking about so you think 12a west late hunt is better than 12b uh late hunt the 12b west um or or do you put them equal i flip a coin on them it doesn't matter to me i think they're both awesome hunts um i've talked to a lot of guys non-residents this year with 2021 points that are waiting for that 13b 13a tag um trying to talk them into the 12, 12, a West, 12 B West tags, just because, you know, they're looking at 400 guys ahead of them well in their points and ahead of them with, with 20 points, you know, they're just feasibly not going to be in that 13 B range in their lifetime. So they've got to draw a tag before, before, you know, time runs out on them um, where they can't physically get around and, and maybe they don't want to get around at that point. Uh, and a lot of guys I talk to are looking, you know, 13 B only, and they're talking about 190, 195 bucks, you know, is what their goal would be. Well, if, if, if your goal is 190, 195, there's no reason you shouldn't be putting in for 12 A West, 12 B West. Um, cause you can do it in both units, uh, and draw it a lot sooner than you can. Obviously a strip tag. Is it almost a bummer for you to have both of those hunts, uh, 12 A West, 12 B West at the same exact time? No, not at all, because I've got guys that have been, you know, hunting and guiding up there for, for well over 20 years, some some over 30 years. No, but I mean um, just you personally wanting to be in both units and pound one here and pound oh, one there personally, you know, just like, dang it, I wish they were just, you know, 10-day hunts, or, you know, five-day hunts, but it was just 10 days and it's back-to-back where you could just go to one, because, I mean, 
I know what it's like to be in one unit and just, even though you're looking at great stuff, you're always wanting to be in another unit too, pounding over there. Exactly. You know, and, 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 and I do, I, you know, and I generally camp right on the boundary of 12B and 12A. Uh, that way I can run a camp, one camp and I can hunt 12A West, 12A East and 12B West all out of the same camp. Um, so I get back to camp. I hear what's going on in other units. That, well, the other units I'm not in at the time. Um, but as soon as I finish out, I jump in the other, you know, with somebody else and we, we start knocking on the next buck and then knock on the next one and just keep going. So I do get the chance to be pretty much in every unit. Like that year we killed that, that mid two fifties buck in 12 B on the early hunt. Um, you know, I, I had three guys in 12 A West that we killed out day six, you know, we were, I was free. So I went out in 12 B West and, and found that buck first thing in the morning, got embedded and then went back to camp got those guys drove them back out there walked them in and got the buck killed um so i got to hunt you know two units and, and kill four bucks in six days so it was uh it was a nice nice deal you but, p- you pig you i love it <laughs> 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 i want to take just a quick second here to thank the sponsors of the podcast i want to thank gohunt.com my friend cody nelson he's the glassing guru the optics authority he is the optics manager at GoHunt.com. If you guys are looking to buy any optics at all, give Cody a call directly at 702-847-8747, extension 2, or you can email him at optics at GoHunt.com. You can also text or call him on his cell phone, 602-399-3699. Uh, I also want to tell you about you can get a $50 GoHunt gift, uh, gear shop gift card just for signing up for the GoHunt Insider. Uh, It is application season, and if you want the best Western hunting resource out there for draw odds and harvest statistics, check out the Go Hunt Insider. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash J. Scott, follow the prompts, and sign up. I also want to thank Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. I just did a podcast with Brendan Burns and Justin Schaefer about the new Velo camo pattern. That's go to Kuyu.com. That's K-U-I-U.com. I also want to thank Phonescope.com. Use the JScott20 promo code to get a 10% discount on all orders. OnxMaps.com. Use the JScott20 promo code to get a 20% discount at OnxMaps.com. And then not, uh, last but not least, Apex Ammunition. Uh, that is the ammo that I used for my Gould's turkey hunts. Go to ApexMunition.com. Uh, that's the home of the tungsten, the TSS Tungsten Super Shot. Um, Jason, let's let's talk about we've talked about the Kaibab. Um, let's jump over to thirteen A, thirteen B. Hey, real quick, real yeah. quick on that, uh, real quick on that Kaibab. You know, I was messing around on on uh, Game and Fish's website earlier today, just just crunching numbers on age class of you know what they've killed mm-hmm. in two thousand nineteen, um, and it might be relevant to some people. But twelve B West had an average of four point five years old last year on the harvest. Uh, 12A, 12 A's had about a 4.1 average age with the oldest deer in 12A being 8, the oldest in 12B being 9, if that's relevant to anybody. I just kind of... Well, I, I think that's that a cool today. number to kind of keep an eye on. And it sounds like 12B, even though it's 4, what was it, 4.2 to 4.1, still a 4. little... 4.5 to 4.2. Yeah, okay. 4.5 I mean, and 12B and 4.2 and 12a i mean that doesn't sound like a lot but i mean that that is a difference um yeah when you talk about just real fast back to the the 12a west 12b from a from a optical standpoint from a glassing standpoint does one unit stand out over the other as you know you can glass it quite a bit better or see into it quite a bit better well the overall 12b you can see 12b west you can see into a lot better than some of 12a west uh now if you take the top of 12a west or 12a east i mean that's you know minus the burn i mean you got firs aspens and and pine trees so you're not glassing very well into that stuff once they get into the winter range it's about equal um there's some giant burns out in 12a west that have circle pockets you know mile two mile three mile circles of, of pinion juniper country that those deer will hold up in and you know obviously glass into that's tough 12B West has a little bit of that. Um, some of the, the patches of Juniper Pinion country just aren't as big as 12, 12A West. Um, you can do a lot of glassing from the vehicle in both units. Uh, you know, miles, you can glass. Um, 
Yeah. I'd say they're pretty equal. Um, maybe 12B having a little bit of edge on Glasson, but you can get definitely get big eyes out in every you know every one of those units. 12 or 12A West, the Kaibab is from a habitat standpoint, they've been doing a phenomenal job with the habitat. If, if you, if you were, um, supreme ruler for a day, I mean, and could go five years and just wait, cut the Kaibab tags way, way back. Do you feel like it would rival the strip as far as some of the, you know, deer that they would be killing, um, you know, pound for pound on, on the strip compared to, you know, say the west side of the Kaibab, if you, if you could just cut the tags way, way back? I really do. Um, if you look back in, in some of the old days and see some of the pipe mass on those bucks because they had that 8, 9, 10-year-old age on them, I mean, they were some impressive deer. Uh, Flagstaff's got a buck in it. Uh, the Game and Fish Department hanging in there from the Kaibab, I think early 80s, 83, 84, something like that. And it's it's one of the most impressive bucks. I mean, he's just got baseball bat mass at the end of all his tines. And a lot of those deer produced that back in the day. But, you know, the problem now is we're just not finding finding those eight, nine-year-old deer. Um, so, yeah, that that's what I would exactly do is try to get the age class up and, and see what these deer would actually do when they hit seven, eight, nine years old. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, let's talk about the strip. Uh, just just a couple questions before we kind of dive in. Um, if you had enough points to draw B or A rifle, which one would you choose? Oof. Uh, this year, I would I hate to say it, but I would I would say thirteen A. How? Why? Um, why? Uh, I, I like a lot of the deer that made it through. Some of my favorite bucks made it through. Um, there was just a lot, a lot of really, really good bucks that I think could explode this year. Uh, it hunts a lot smaller than 13 B. That's a downside. They kept 13 A as a late hunt this year. Again, um, does that play into your, year. like, does that alone play in the, the fact that the hunt is later? Does that play into your equation of putting a first or is it simply just the bucks you know that are still alive it definitely plays into the equation you know they bumped that that 13b hunts early i think one of the earliest i've seen in the last six or seven years uh it's a six this year um we'll definitely get some rut on that hunt um i you know it's gonna it's you know, generally, like I say, I think I've said it in previous podcasts, but I think about the eighth is when I start seeing those bucks really moving some does around. Uh, but we've killed bucks by themselves on the on the tenth, eleventh, twelfth. Uh, that I, I think the thirteen A hunt is shaping up rut wise to be a better rut hunt, um, which might bring some of those deer out of the park. There's a lot of park boundary in thirteen A that hides a lot of deer. Uh, obviously, legally, you can't be in there running cameras or looking at it. Um, so. You can look across it, the gotta, fence, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And drool. It's got a, exactly. <laughs> it's got a lot of hidden country in there that, that could have some absolute, you know, giant, giant deer. Um, it, it, it's a great unit. It's got the same genetics as 13B. Um, hunt smaller, less tags. It's a later hunt this year. It, it would be my first choice. No, no doubt about it. Okay, let's And there's going to be there's going to be plenty of plenty of bucks over 220 in there and I'll be definitely some bucks in the 250 plus range. Let's let's take the same question with the 13A 13B archery hunt this year. Um you've got a, let's say you have enough points to draw either one, which one is your first choice? Well, I did 13 I my mine would be 13B 13A in that order because 13B hunts bigger. Now there's 25 tags instead of 15 tags. Uh, 15 tags being in 13a but 25 tags in 13b if you stay away from you know the the mega giants uh you can have a phenomenal hunt and hunt by yourself if you want to play with the 250 240 type bucks you're gonna you're gonna have a lot of competition you know stiff competition on it you know with a lot of spotters a lot of radios um but if you want to jump into a 215 210 220 type buck you might have it all to yourself I did a podcast recently with Clay Bundy, and I asked him this same question. I'm curious your thoughts on. And we're, let's talk about the strip specifically as it pertains to trail cameras. Um, do you believe that 
the use of trail cameras by outfitters has actually increased the age class of bucks that have been taken on the strip over the last handful of years. In other words, because the outfitters, you guys know what bucks are around, there's a great buck that pops up and you tell your hunter, hey, let's let that one go. And then now that buck gets one more year older. Do you believe that trail cameras have increased the age class of bucks on the Arizona Strip? Well, I think that's a catch-22 question in, in my head. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to listen to Clay's podcast on that, but, I, you know, it's it's increased the overall average, I believe, of maybe age and size of, of bucks that we're harvesting. Yeah, um, and I should have I should have said age and size. I mean, just overall age, overall size of bucks. Yes, that's yeah. I mean, we're you know last year, you know, I I went through that thing again this morning on the age class over there, but we're killing deer that are three and a half years old that are two hundred five, two hundred ten inches. Um, nobody in their right mind, you know, is going to pass a two hundred ten inch deer, uh, minus it being something they just don't like. So. You know, in the old days before the cameras, say say 2008, 2007, before mass production of the cameras, um, you know, my first digital camera, I think, was 2004 or 5. Um, but when people started putting 100, 200 cameras out, you know, I, I think was about 2010. I don't think we killed, on average, the amount of great big bucks we're killing now. So, so the catch-22, I guess, is what I'm saying is I, I think that's going to come to an end. I mean, I, I think the strip could be in some trouble in the future you're always going to have those three and a half year old deer they're going to be 200 inches or or better and then you're always going to have those giants that that make it through um but not the numbers that used to make it through because we know what's out there and we know what we're targeting so it's a catch-22 with the cameras it really is I, i'm not a huge fan of the cameras i've got to run them to to stay competitive in my business and and know what's out there know being you know being the spot i need to be in um, but that being said, if we continue on the path, we're continuing like we did in 2019, where the archery guys just annihilated it. And then the rifle guys went in there and annihilated it. Um, that would have never happened 20 years ago. So we, yeah, we did kill bigger bucks with the camera usage, but how long is that going to sustain? I guess is my question. I got you. So what you're saying is because of the efficiency you do it long enough, all of a sudden we're, we're probably going to see the quality decline, the age class decline, because basically the outfitters have gotten so good and so efficient that the cameras have allowed them to finally suck the cream off the top, the age, and now all of a sudden you've got to where there's not as many big bucks as there used to be. Whereas if there were no cameras at all, you'd have some, you know, 190 95 inch deer that probably get shot that you know over the next ridge and after they shoot they walk up and you know 225 walks off you know and if they would have just known that the buck was there they probably would have held off on that deer 100 percent right you know and, that, and and the cameras not only are gonna in my head are gonna affect what what goes on on the strip and and I mean, we've already seen it with the elk hunts too i mean nine's a perfect example of that but um it 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 takes away a guy's experience on the strip unless he's really mentally prepared for what the strip entails these days with the camera usage because you know i might have this picture of this you know 260 inch deer well so does 10 other outfitters on the right. strip right um which those 10 other outfitters are going to have 20 spotters a piece with them. So opening morning on that 260 buck, like 2019, I mean, there's going to be well over a hundred people in that area. Right. So every year, every single year I get an email or a direct message on Instagram from someone that has put in for the strip and has drawn 13 a or 13 B and they send a message and they say, I'm not going with an outfitter and I'm just going to go up there and, you know, do my best and da, 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 da. And, and they, and it happens every time they say, I'm just going to go up there and I'm going to find an out of the way place and just go hunt some bucks. And I tell yep. them, 
if you think that you're just going to wander up to the Arizona Strip and just find an out-of-the-way place and just go hunt some bucks, you have no idea what you're getting into. I tell them, listen, the reality is, if it were me and I was going to, first of all, I wouldn't go up there and not, and not hire an outfitter. I am an outfitter and I wouldn't go up there without an outfitter because I don't know the place. Okay. So, but, right. but the best thing you could do is two or three days before the hunt, you drive around on the roads and see where you see at least 10 vehicles, at least check it on a map, keep driving around where you see 10 vehicles and go, okay, well, there's a big buck here. There's a big buck. And, and they always come back and say, oh no, I'm going to find the out of the way place. I'm like, if you're looking for the out of the way place, you're not going to have a buck to hunt. Like yep. there's a person on basically every buck, every decent buck in the unit. And they just don't understand. They don't, they don't understand the game that is being played up there. And, you know, like you said, you made a point about the cameras you have to use them to be competitive. If they take them away, you'll go back to old school tactics as well as a lot of other outfitters will as well. But, um, you know, it is what it is. If they're legal, you have to use them as an outfitter, period. If you don't, you're, I mean, you are, you're basically pissing in the wind. Exactly. You, you, you have to use them. And, and, you know, it's a good, that, that, that's a good analogy with, with following trucks around. I mean, it's like the old peanuts, uh, comic strip you know with the oh the dusty kid whatever his name was <laughs> i know um, what you're talking about yeah yeah you know he's you just follow the dust cloud around and yeah. and you're you know you find a road that's got eight inches of powder on it there's a giant deer there um yeah but if you're listening to the podcast and you have a notion you know or you just draw it randomly and you think that you're just going to go up there and do it on your own i'm not discouraging anyone from going and hunting on their own what I'm discouraging is having the notion that you just think you're going to wander up there and just find some giant buck all by yourself out in the middle of nowhere. And the reality is that just doesn't happen. I mean, most big, big no. deer, somebody knows about them and they'll have a spotter up looking for that deer. And sometimes there's designated spotters that they have a certain area and they're looking for that deer. And their whole job is just to find that deer and, you know, call for backup when they find that deer and it could be you know two days it could be six days into the hunt or nine you know it's it's um it's just the game that's being played it, it is exactly what it is. like and and it's not to bl i don't blame the outfitters one bit it's it's where we're at like if you yep. want to compete and kill that's, big deer you've got to play the, the game that that is the game you know, and even myself, if I was the quick guide in the day and I drew the strip tag next year, I'd be hiring somebody, even as well as I know the strip and, and the deer I know, because I've gotten so many phone calls. Well, my buddy had it, you know, seven years ago, or, you know, my buddy's had it three times. He's killed, you know, three great bucks. So he knows where to go. Well, that's not the case either, because no. I would never run any, I, I'd run five cameras every year and that's it because I've got to cover the, I've got to cover 13B and 13A because who knows where they're going to be that, that next year. Right. And every single year is different. Yeah. You might get lucky and park your truck and, or drive down the road and kill a 220 buck, but your chances of even seeing a deer, you'll probably drive, drive 15 days before you even see a deer from the road. I mean, there's just not that many deer up there. Yeah. Real fast. I want to talk about any other hunts. Uh, I know you do OTC, uh, December hunts, uh, January hunts uh, for archery. Anything you want to hit on as far as that, or if guys want to call and talk to you about it? Yeah, generally what I do on those hunts, I, I don't book ahead like a lot of outfitters are doing. Um, you know, especially for August hunts because I try to be on the archery strip. On you know, the archery strip is what I like being on for uh, the August hunt. So that kind of takes place of the over the counter hunt. I put all my time and and effort into 13a and 13b for for guys that draw that tag and have that once in a lifetime tag so i'm very limited on on august hunts um so the december january hunts i i don't book those either um until i see what's going on with my fall um i don't like to do that i like to i like deer draw results to come out so i don't generally even book those until right at the end of july into august is when i'll start booking december january hunts just to see what my fall plays out how much time i'm gonna have um 
and and what I draw. You know, hopefully one day I draw a sheep tag, and I'm spending 31 days in December out 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 in the desert. So, um, how many points you got? 28 right now. Out of boy, you got I got so, 25, so you got three more than me. Yeah, so ho- hopefully this is the year. Yeah, I think I put in for the easiest hunts possible this year, so we'll see what happens. You know, it's one of those things we've said about on these, I've done some sheep podcasts, it's it's one of these things, you know, at 28, you think, man, I'm almost there, but the reality is you're still behind. You're young enough that you could probably wait it out and, and probably be in the max pool one of these days, but um, if you're not in the max pool, it you know, you have a little bit better chance with 28, but it doesn't really matter if you had 9 or 28. You still don't have max points, so you have to apply for some of those units that are, you know, mathematically easier to draw. Uh, Jason, it's always great having you on the podcast. Uh, I got to run here. Um, it's always great talking to you. I want to give you a chance to let the listeners know how they can reach out, and I'll also link it up in the show notes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, it's Bond Trophy Outfitters. You can give me a call at uh, 928-637-8378 or send me a text. Uh, My email is jbflagstaff at gmail.com. And then uh, you can follow Bond Trophy Outfitters on Instagram or Facebook. Uh, I kind of post some updates and stuff on there. Awesome, man. It's always great talking to you. Uh, You're a wealth of knowledge and um, look forward to seeing how you do this fall and Uh, Thanks for coming on and sharing with us. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Take care. Take care. God bless.